Welcome to the Jesus Church Podcast. We're a family seeking to become like Jesus, empowered by His presence, to partner in God's creative work of restoring the world. We pray this episode encourages and equips you along the journey. We're all in process, becoming something. Like a potter throwing clay or an artist mixing color, our lives are being formed. Different backgrounds and experiences blemished and cracked. Each day, an opportunity to move into or out of all that God has purposed. So the question isn't if we are becoming, but rather who are we becoming? And in this family, we want to go on the journey of becoming like Jesus together. Well, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing today? Yeah. Oh, wow. That was like kind of, let, let's just try it again. Let's just kind of start over. Everybody needs a second chance, right? Here we go. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing today? There you go. There you go. It is so Great to be back. Brittany and I were down in San Diego suffering for Jesus this past week, uh, get, connecting with actually one of our church plants down there, Park Hill. Uh, Evan and Sandy used to be on staff. We're a part of their board. It's really great, amazing to be a part of a community. We plan, I can't believe it's been six years since we planted out Park Hill, and they are doing amazing. Crazy enough, though, like the entire time we were there, I think we saw the sun for like 20 minutes. Uh, it's, it was just like rainy and cold. It was like Portland with palm trees, you know? Uh, anyways, but, so we're super glad to be back today uh, and, and celebrating with you. I want to do a special shout out to all my fellow dads in the room. Uh, whether, you're, whether you're in that category of like just brand new father or whether you're a grandpa or whether you're a spiritual father to some kids that you know around you, well done. This this generation, this time needs good fathers who love Jesus, who are pursuing Jesus and willing to kind of gently and lovingly raise up this next generation of followers of Jesus. We do actually have a small gift for you on the way out. It's just kind of like a prophetic encouragement to kind of give you a shot in the arm as you think about what it is that God's calling you to in this next season. So anyways, today is a big day. We are wrapping up our almost year-long series in the book of Luke on becoming like Jesus. I can't believe we've been doing this series that long, but today is our last day. If you need a Bible, go ahead and throw a hand up. Uh, one of the ushers around the room would love to get one into your hand. Um, but before we jump in, I, want to do, I do want to give a little bit of a plug for our next series, which starts next week. Uh, next week, we're going to be jumping into a series called Undivided. We're going to spend the summer exploring what it means to be a people that worships Jesus with undivided hearts in every area of our lives. We're so excited as a teaching team for this series. Our plan is to study what it means to worship, to dig deeper into what the Bible says about what it means for us as a people to respond to him. Uh, we're, we're gonna look at models like men and women from the scriptures that, that show us what worship is uh, and, and what it looks like for us to participate in worship, to, to jump into worship. And that God is doing an incredible thing right now in the church and in, in all of society, in our culture. And, and we wanna be a part of that. We wanna, we wanna see how we can engage that. And we're excited about this series because we feel like it's a time for us to kind of lift up our eyes to him and get our feet moving and join in in this very unique time in history to participate with Jesus. So, but anyways, we are wrapping up our series uh, in Luke today. And so if you got your Bibles, flip to the very end of Luke, Luke 24. And then once you get there, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand up to your feet as I read the passage out over us that we're going to be looking at today. Luke 24, starting in verse 13. Now, that same day, Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, 
their faces downcast, one of them named Cleopas asked him, are are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be God. Lord, we want to thank you so much for the fact that you are a God that moves with us. For the the very real experience of having you walk alongside us on the road. Thank you. We We want to walk with you, Jesus. We want to be on the path that you want us to be on. Forgive us when we're blind to you, Holy Spirit, lead us, make us, mold us, form us into your image, Jesus. We love you. This is all for you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. You can grab a seat. In the intro to uh, John Tyson's book called Beautiful Resistance, a great book for our day and age, by the way, if you're looking for a read. Um, He describes a powerful moment that happened in Poland in the 1930s. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, this remarkable German theologian and pastor, he wrote some like must reads, uh, Life Together, The Cost of Discipleship. He had formed a school of discipleship with the sole intent of shaping a new kind of disciple and pastor in the face of, of rising Nazi hatred. Disciples whose allegiance was to King Jesus, not the political and cultural pressures of the time, who were willing to say, any time, any place, any cost, I will follow. This was a dangerous faith in a dangerous time. At one point, uh, one of Bonhoeffer's friends came to talk with him about the nature of the program and some of his teaching. It was causing waves. Passion for the way of Jesus and submission to his rule was creating tension and persecution. Loyalty to Jesus meant meant opposing some of the political and cultural norms of the day. He was ruffling feathers. Was this level of formation truly needed? Uh, Was this kind of devotion to Jesus in that day, was it actually necessary Bonhoeffer proceeded to take his friend up to a neighboring hillside that looked down on an active like Nazi military base. There were planes landing and taken off and soldiers marching in ranks, training, practicing, being discipled. And he explained, to beat that kind of discipline, you would need a superior kind of discipline. Or as John Tyson would go on to say, Discipleship must be stronger than cultural formation. Loyalty must be stronger than compromise. This must be stronger than that. The times called for a beautiful resistance. And I believe that our time calls for it as well. All of society is actively forming us. It's actively discipling us. There is literally no neutral space. And the vast majority of that discipling is coming through this little device. And we've all heard the statistics, right? I mean, the average person touches their phone 2,617 times, okay? Spends about two hours and 24 minutes a day on some form of social media, 
or 40 to 50 minutes a day texting. The average teen spends upwards of nine hours a day in front of a screen of some sort, and five of those being on a phone. 66% of people suffer from nomophobia, the fear of not having their phone close at hand. And I could go on and on. Aristotle famously wrote, we are what we repeatedly do. And if that's the case, if that's true, we are quickly becoming an anxiety-ridden, entertainment-driven, consumeristic, distracted people. And what makes these statistics frightening is not the colossal waste of time and resources they represent. We could do a deep dive into that. But it's, it's that our phones have actually inadvertently become our rabbis. And though there are many good uses for the technology and the information and people that they connect us to, it's influence over us. It's ability to get us to, to buy now, to, to swipe right or swipe left, to linger, to explore, to respond, to get lost, to go deeper, to spend more, to watch longer, to like, to dislike, to love, to share, to, to play on, to, to lose yourself. Its ability to do that is much more powerful than any of us want to admit. And so much of what our digital rabbis are teaching us is anti-kingdom. Consume this. Lust after that. Hate those people over there with algorithms that are literally created to make us things, think that these things will make us happy. Our global society has become disciples of whoever has the most attractive clickbait, the, the video game or the app or some emotionally engaging video or even more terrifying, well-curated, statistically biased, AI-generated content. Much of our cultural formation isn't even human anymore. Maybe, maybe it's time for us to consider another path. Last week, Chris did a fantastic job of, of leading us through Luke 23 and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And at Easter, we talked about his resurrection and all the story that happened around that. But what happened next? Well, that's where our story picks up with two disciples, likely on their way home, making their way from Jerusalem to the small town of Emmaus, which is just, not, you know, just outside of Jerusalem. And, and because the second individual is, not, is left unnamed, uh, and, and they apparently shared a home. Many church traditions think that these were actually a husband and wife, that they, were, that they were on their way home processing together. What's clear is that they weren't a part of that original 12, but they were disciples of Jesus, processing the grief of mismet expectations and disappointment. What's, what's not clear is why it is that Jesus, they were kept from recognizing him. You know, similar to those interactions, remember we talked about at the tomb, there was something about him that made him unfamiliar. Maybe it was them, maybe it was something going on in their heart, maybe it was the enemy plugging their ears. Either way, Jesus just kind of casually comes up alongside these two disciples. It's wild to me to imagine Jesus just moving at the same pace as these heartbroken travelers. I mean, he's just resurrected from the dead, right? There's, there's no light show his body's not still glowing, you know? He's just a guy walking alongside of a couple making their way home. And Jesus starts with making small talk, right? So what are you two talking about? I mean, can you imagine these two, like, who is this guy? Like, are you the only one that doesn't know all that's been going on? Is Jesus like playing dumb? Or, or maybe he's baiting them? Is God allowed to do that? I mean, there's an almost playful coyness to Jesus as he interacts with these disciples. What things? It's like Jesus is purposely getting them to, to unpack their sorrow. Not just sitting in it, but processing it. God asking questions. Do we have a theology that allows God to process our pain with us? Not just lamenting, which is good and appropriate at times, but actually going a step beyond that. 
What things, asks Jesus. Tell me about what's causing your hurt. Unpack it for me. This is the Jesus who meets us in our pain and helps us walk through it. Wonderful counselor, prince of peace, almighty God. Sometimes we move too quickly through those Christmas titles of Jesus. Jesus counsels these disciples. So they unpack the story and and they lay out all of their disappointments as they walk along the path. We likely only get like a small overview of what actually took place. How I would love to have been the fourth person walking on that path. Can you imagine? I mean, it's Jesus just sat there and listened through the details of the very event that he was the center of. All the while, remaining anonymous, asking questions, pulling at the threads of their experience. But it's what Jesus does next that I want to zoom in on. Luke 24, starting in verse 25, says this. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all of the scriptures concerning himself. Can you imagine? I don't know who your favorite Bible teacher is. Maybe you're like a Bible project person or you love listening to all the great podcasts out there, but there is nothing that could compare with getting the scriptural walkthrough from Jesus himself. Can you imagine? It must have been amazing. And he isn't like mamsy pamsy about it. Like, why are you so slow to believe? Jesus points back to the prophets, men and women who had called Israel to obedience, to holiness, to repentance, and had pointed forward to a time when Israel would be redeemed and reconciled to Yahweh through the Messiah, through this coming king. Even Moses pointed forward to this time. In verse 26, Jesus probes, did not the Messiah have to suffer? Asking the question that honestly had plagued the disciples and had vexed the Pharisees, both groups would have given a hearty no, No, he doesn't have to suffer. Their version of Messiah left no room for the suffering servant. And then, beginning with the Torah, the the first five books written by Moses, and then all of the prophets, which included much of the rest of the Old Testament, Jesus walked through the story, his story. In verse 28, Jesus makes it seem as if he's continuing on. As if to say he was done, which is crazy because he still hadn't even revealed himself to them yet, but they urge him to stay. What's going on here? Recently, I I heard a teacher explain this portion of text this way. Jesus was happy to be a counselor and a teacher. That's what they needed in that moment, to go as far as what was needed. But when he was wanted, he went a little further because God always goes where he is wanted. Let me say that again. God always goes where he is wanted. Their urging was a form of faith their desire for more, a statement about who they wanted to be. It was a form of yes. They had gotten the counselor and the teacher. Now they would get the friend and the king, the one who would share a roof and a meal and the one who would break bread and commune with them. Verse 30 goes on and says this. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight and they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. Were not our hearts burning within us 
For most of us who follow Jesus, we get this experience, don't we? That moment when something shifts inside of our chest. John Wesley used to call it like that being, the idea of being strangely warmed, your heart being strangely warmed. The Spirit ignites in our heart and we know that we're in the presence of God. And I'm sure there was more confusion than clarity for this too, for these, for these two disciples, but I love their response. The fire had been rekindled. And though they had no idea what was going on, they were getting back in the game. They, they were getting back on the path. The king had returned and they needed to be with their people. Man, there's so much in this story for us as a people. How often do we feel like these disciples, right? We, we've gone to church, we've, we've read our Bibles, we maybe have even had some wonderful experiences with Jesus, but then disappointment, mismet expectations. Life doesn't work out how we thought it would, especially post-COVID. Maybe Jesus is out there, but we just don't see him or recognize him. Is he there? What I love about the Emmaus Road is that Jesus comes to these disciples on their journey. He, he comes to them on the path that they were already walking. Now, I, I love walking. Any other walkers out there? People just, I, I love walking. Uh, the last number of years, it's kind of become a place where I've found my, my own prayer life just unfolding. And though I do love going for a walk in like a new city or a cool neighborhood, my favorite place to walk is in the forest or out in the countryside to, to kind of take in the sound of the birds and the, the wind in the trees, the water trickling down the streams to drink in the quiet. It's just so much easier to hear in the quiet. The problem is our lives have gotten so loud, right? They've gotten so busy, so distracted. It's more like we're walking through a carnival or, or, or some overcrowded market where all of the vendors are like hawking their wares all at the same time. So much is competing for our limited bandwidth. Friends, there, there's only one way to compete with that kind of noise. We need to start walking in quieter places. We need to start stepping away from some of the noise and learning how to listen to the voice of God again in the quiet. To be formed into the disciples Jesus has called us to be in 21st century Portland, to become more like Jesus on Monday morning, there are three things that I believe he is calling us to, to respond from this Emmaus Road text, really to respond from the entire book of Luke. First, I think Jesus is calling us as disciples to actively turn down some of the noise around us. But let's be real honest. Turning down the noise in our life is like going to war. They're loud. And there are billions of dollars being spent every year trying to keep us coming back for more. With the amount of exposure we have to anti-kingdom propaganda every single day, how could we even hope to resist the discipleship of this world by simply going to church once a week? Well, one of the ways that we learn how to resist the discipleship of this world is by reclaiming our imaginations. Now, I gotta be honest, this is an idea, even a phrase that I stole from my son. Reclaiming our imaginations. My son, Kelton, he's been up here before. You guys have seen him and met him. He's out, out at Moody right now. He is a, uh, he's this guy that's like, he wants to, if he believes something, he's like, I wanna put it into action. And a number of years back, he just got to a point where he realized that there was so much coming at him through his phone, through his social media, through all of the avenues around him that he wanted to reclaim some of his imagination, reclaim some of his own heart and mind. So he simply turned them off. He said, you know what? Other people, they might be able to, to do a good job of putting boundaries around time. And so he's like, 
but not me. I need to just turn this noise off. And so in an act of reclaiming his imagination, he stopped, he jumped off social media, he simplified his phone, he brought it down. It's, it's like the simplest phone you've ever did see. Well, a number of months ago, in a, after a conversation, he was home, I might have think been after Christmas, he got talking to his sister Mackenzie, you guys have all met. And honestly, she was like, you know what, I'm the same. I, I want to reclaim my imagination. So she did the same thing. Simplified down, jumped off social media. It's amazing how much noise is coming through just that one act to, to make a statement about reclaiming your imagination. Now, you, you might be out there and like, this is not a thing for you. You're like, actually, I'm pretty good at boundaries and I know how to control that voice. But for some of us, it's really hard. My wife and I have been processing this. After our two Gen Z kids are like leading the way in this, we've like said, you know what? Like, we want to follow them as they follow Jesus. So we're doing the same thing. Now, again, this isn't everybody's show. I know some of you is like, this is my job. This is what I do. And I get that. But for those of us that maybe this is hard, it's hard to control that voice. It's hard to control the way that it influences, the way that it gets me to think about myself, the way that it shapes my world around me. For those of us, sometimes turning it down is not enough. Sometimes we have to turn it off. To become more like Jesus, we must turn down the voices, these external voices that are discipling us every day. It's only then, it's only then that we will begin to hear our own internal voices that are also discipling us in an anti-kingdom way. Whether it's from our family of origin or past hurt or the enemy, we must learn to be more honest with ourselves, more honest with Jesus as we walk down the path let him process our pain, process our brokenness. The thing is, it's not normally our brokenness that's keeping us from them. It's our busyness. Our lives are so full that we've, we've begun to confuse attendance with obedience. We've confused, we, we've confused hearing things about Jesus with being with Jesus. Now, I want to be clear, attending Church on Sunday is a great place to start. We are so glad you're here. But church attendance, it's not the same thing as daily obedience to Jesus. The life he has called us to live, it, it means stepping into it in a daily kind of way. We've allowed ourselves to be discipled by so many other things, people, things, ideologies, which leads me to the second point. My second point is we must walk with Jesus, all of him. Every part of him, the counselor, the teacher, the friend, the king. Jesus invites us to walk with him through our disappointments. He, he invites us into a conversation around those places where our expectations have not been met. Even our expectations about him. What we thought he would do for us, in us, with us. He invites us to be honest with him. Jesus is not afraid of our honesty, but... And there is a but. He is also not content to leave us there. Jesus is not satisfied with leaving us in our brokenness or our fragmented understanding of reality. He longs to meet with us, to bring his peace and perspective that his presence brings to shape us as we walk through our pain and our sorrow. And it could be difficult to be honest with God honest with our lopsided expectations. We, we may say we want Jesus in his way, but then we go on and plan our own lives, hoping that Jesus will kind of just like bless them. The problem is this, this is not the way of a disciple. A disciple comes to their rabbi open-handed. They come to their teacher ready to listen and obey. Remember, he's the cornerstone. To be clear, Jesus discipleship to Jesus doesn't mean that our identity disappears. It just means that our identity rests in his hands. And Jesus, he molds us into his image. As we come to him with the broken pieces, he puts them back together as he sees fit because he's a master artist and he's the king. 
But what does this look like practically? What does it look like in everyday life? Well, what did Jesus do with these disciples? He listened to them. He drew out their pain. He dealt with, he talked through their disappointment, and then he took them on a journey through the Bible. Jesus used the scriptures to explain to these disciples the mission of God. He was the king that everyone had been waiting for, and he's the king that we have been waiting for. You know, I am, um, for me, what does this look like practically? For me, this looks like something I call PB and J's. Now, I do like peanut butter and jelly, but that's not what this stands for. PB and J's, prayer Bible journal. I meet with Jesus, the counselor, teacher, friend, and king every day. Every day I come to him, I open myself up and say, Lord, What's going on inside of me that I need to give back to you? And he brings these things up and I process with him. I sometimes use a journal. Sometimes I just do it on a walk. I go to the scriptures. I seek out who is God? How is he Messiah? How is he king to me in my life in these scriptures that I'm I'm looking at? And I spend time wrestling over that to allow him to change me. And I give him space every day to do that. You see... This, this is his story. And and our human nature, it often tries to like slide us into the center of it. But as, as we process with Jesus and as he teaches us a better way, we find healing in the truth of his centrality, not ours. Let me say that again. As he works with us, as he molds us, we find healing in the truth of his centrality, not ours. He is the center of the story that we live. And and when we become his disciples, we commit ourselves to finding our way on his path, not trying to get him to join us on ours. Now, he meets us there, but he calls us to join him on his path. Again, this doesn't mean we lose our identity. It just means that our identity gets defined, clarified, refined, focused in Jesus as we follow him. And what's more, as we follow him, we discover this incredible reality. He loves us. And he he wants to be both our king and our friend. Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. And as we learn to hear and obey, we begin entrusting ourselves more fully and completely to his path. The stunning reality of discipleship to Jesus is the more we become like him, the more we find ourselves. It might be him calling right now. The stunning reality of discipleship to Jesus is the more we become like him, the more we find ourselves becoming who we were always meant to be. Which means, third, we must fan the flame every day. As we seek to encounter Jesus through his Holy Spirit, who is literally here with us right now in this moment, waiting for our yes, and we faithfully seek Jesus through the scriptures every day, waiting upon him, learning from him, letting him change us, we open up our hands to our rabbi. This is what it means to be formed. This is what it looks like to create a stronger form of discipleship here versus out there. This is what it means to be on the path. But if my formation to Jesus is going to be stronger than my formation to the world, then I need to prioritize that formation. I have it as a, as a habit, both Brittany and I have as a habit, to both start our day and end our day in his presence. We want him to have the first part and the last part every single day. The first word and the last word. The first word and the last word. As we create a discipleship here that is able to resist the discipleship from out there, we say, Lord, you have your way. You make me into your image. The world, I mean, I was reminded of this this morning in pre-gathering prayer. The world needs more Jesus. 
They need, Portland needs more of him. And, and, and how, how that plays itself out practically is the world gets us shaped by him. And so if we're not stepping in, if we're not opening up our hands, if we're not saying, Lord, make me more like you, he's really wanting to talk to us. Somebody's answering. <laughs> if, we, if we aren't willing to open up our hands and say, yes, Lord, now, I want to look like you. I want to be like you. I want to bring you to my city, to my workplace, to my neighborhood, to my school. If we don't open up our hands and give him our life to do that with, then the world doesn't get our Jesus. Friends, are we ready? Are we ready to quiet the noise? Are we ready to start walking every day with Jesus, to fan the flame every day? Are we ready to become like Jesus? That is the invitation of our series, and that's the invitation for this morning. Would you stand to your feet? I want to take just a moment, if you would, kind of a regular part of our practice around here. We really want to hear from God first and foremost. More than just like uh, the thoughts that we have, we want to hear his thoughts. And we believe in a God who speaks. So this is how we practice. I invite you to go ahead, if you're, if you're distracted by movement around you, go ahead and close your eyes. Just open up your hands. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, we invite your presence to speak. We invite you to be the loudest voice in the room. We don't want to give the world more clever ideas and more homework. We want to give the world you. So Jesus, remake us, reform us. As a part of this journey, we, we just acknowledge the fact that today is like a day where we celebrate fathers. And there are, even now in this room, there are, there are dads-to-be, there are, are dads who, um, who are grandpas. But we have a generation that has just missed that father blessing. And don't worry, I'm not gonna invite you to come forward, but if, if I could have just the dads in the room raise your hand. If you're around a dad, if you wouldn't mind just asking if you could put a hand on their shoulder. I just want to, if it's your dad, you can like hug him. Yeah, I see the Freemans out there. And I just want to pray a blessing over you, a father blessing. Lord, you know how close to my heart this is. I believe that there is a generation of men in this room who you have called to be fathers, to father how you would father, to love how you would love, to, to, to urge and to gently walk forward how you would do that, to walk alongside them, Jesus, just like you would. You called a generation of men to do that. And many of them, they didn't get the, the father that they should have had. For some reason, and I don't know it, but you do. And so right now, Lord Jesus, in your name and with your authority, I pray a blessing over the fathers in this room. Would you bless them, Lord? Bless them to hear from you loudly. 
Would you turn up your voice, Holy Spirit, in their lives? Would they hear you? Would they hear the whisper to go to the left, to go to the right? Lord, would you move them from the inside? Would you bless them with courage to take the steps that they need to be to be the men of God you've called them to be? Would you bless them, Lord Jesus, with the power to stand in a generation that is bent on throwing them over, bent on pushing them back? Would you give them the courage to stand, but to stand as you would stand, not with these overinflated egos, not with anger, not with rage, but to stand with courage and kindness and love, a veracity that says, yes, I can stand. I will be faithful. I will stand by my wife. I will stand by my kids. I will stand for you, Jesus, in this day. Would you give them that courage and that ability? Would you raise up a generation of fathers, even the young dads in this room, who can dig their heels in and make the hard calls and be the cheerleader when they need to be the cheerleader and be the shoulder to cry on when they need to be the shoulder to cry on. Would you do a mighty work in our day, Lord, through these men? We just declare, Jesus, that we want fathers that look like you. And would you anoint them with your Holy Spirit now to be those men? We pray these things looking at you, Jesus, eyes locked on you, knowing you had a good father. And we pray this blessing in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening. For more resources and to partner with us through giving, visit us at JesusChurch.org.